great. Welcome. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, they didn't cue the sitcom applause like they said they were going to do. <laughs> we can. We can. I know. All right. Welcome to the inside the actor studio. Um, <laughs> My name is uh, Brian Holcomb. I'm the curator at the Moss Arts Center. I uh, want to welcome Craig to the stage to discuss his uh, work and his current exhibition, uh, First Act, Scene Two, that opened yesterday in the Ruth Horton Gallery. And the exhibition will be on view until December 17th. Also, uh, wanted to note that this exhibition runs concurrent with Steve Locke's The Daily Practice of Painting in the uh, Sherwood Quinlan Gallery and the Miles Horton Jr. Gallery. And Steve's is consisting of a daily record of Locke's painting practice. Uh, this exhibition, Steve's exhibition features 114 small male portraits and Locke's work engages ideas around masculinity, relationships among men, um, and how we ascribe meaning to portraiture. So I hope you check both of the exhibitions out. Um, Craig, sitting here, he was born in Ohio and raised in uh, central West Virginia. Uh, he currently lives and works in Atlanta, Georgia. He is a painter and a 2018 Guggenheim Fellow. He's exhibited in Nashville, Birmingham, and Atlanta, as well as New York City, Boston, and Los Angeles. He has been an artist in residence at Yaddo McDowell, at the Triangle Arts Foundation, and Skowhegan. And his work has been reviewed in Art in America, Art Forum, and the New York Times and the Boston Globe. Uh, Craig served as the Dean of Skowhegan, and he currently teaches at Georgia State University and manages the end project space, which we could talk more about yeah. later. So thank you all for joining us today and welcome, Craig. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you guys for coming. Yeah. Um, and again, this is the most posh venue I've ever uh, been at, so thank you for inviting me, and uh, this is pretty glorious. So yeah. have, have some good questions yeah. ready. That always, yeah. that, always makes it, uh, that always makes it livelier. Mm -hmm. Well, this is like a run through for the next award presentation. Oh, so, sir, so, you flatter you me. Use. Yeah. It's your best quality. Yeah. <laughs> that is one of the characters, Flattering Lords. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. So I, I just want to start off with, um, you know, you built this body of work around one of uh, Shakespeare's lesser known plays, Timon of Athens. And would you just start like off by giving us a short overview of the play? Yes, I can happily do that. And uh, I will say that, you know, when I first heard about uh, the play, Time of Athens, I, uh, it was in a review, not, not of that play, but it was a review of like summer theater in I think uh, Central Park, Shakespeare in the Park. And the, the critic, I mean, it was probably Midsummer Night's Dream. That's usually what they haul out during that moment. Fine, no judgment, fine. But the, re the reviewer was saying things like, well, this was disappointing, that was disappointing, this person didn't perform, the sets were, were kind of shoddy, comma, but at least it wasn't Time of Athens. And I thought, well, what's this? And so I looked into it and I became fascinated by a, a location uh, where, where poverty and greatness seemed like they were welded together for like the most recognized name in the Western canon being Shakespeare, and yet his most kind of, you know, impoverished moment. And so that, that's a fascinating place for me to begin. And, and I always, I like to begin these multi-year projects. And I've been doing this for 14 years now, but I like to, I like to start with a found subject. You know, something's already in the world that the audience will maybe have heard of, but not really know anything about. And then I have heard of it, and then I learn about it, and it becomes a meeting place for me and the audience and everybody else. So, um, so that was why for, I picked it having not read the play and having no, no real understanding of what the play was even about. And then when I did read it, it was, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a grim scene. It's rarely performed. I know we have some theater folks in the audience who will know much more about it than I do. But, but it's, uh, I mean, I think I, 
it's not really a hot take if I say it's a bit of a train wreck of a play. <laughs> and, uh, and even just you can't follow the script as written because there are characters who, are, who have name changes from like page one to, to page like 18. Like the, the, the thieves are now called the bandits, the banditi and like characters who uh, aren't introduced who suddenly say a line. You're like, wait a minute, how'd they get on stage and so forth. So <laughs> by all accounts, it was a rough draft. Shakespeare never thought it was one of his works. So seven years after his death, uh, the folio of 1623, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's when it first appeared because folks found it and they thought, oh, Here's, a, here's an unperformed play by Shakespeare. Certainly we can make some money from that. Probably other people, I mean, not probably, with certainty, other people uh, also wrote into it. At least two people, maybe four to six more authors were in it. So it's just a, it's a mess. So my, uh, by me selecting this play, it isn't that I'm a fan of it or I'm trying to recuperate its reputation. I picked it because it's the weakest spot in the strongest part of the Western canon, like the Shakespeare brand. So I've, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a jackal, and I saw the weakest zebra, <laughs> and I have, I've been eating it for 14 years. <laughs> Beautiful analogy. I'm not going to walk that back. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is the second time that you've taken yeah. a uh, existing right. piece. Right. And like the previous one was the Supergirl movie starring Helen Slater. Which ah, yes. This, and this series you worked on for five and a half years? Yes, and that yeah. was the first one. Uh, maybe, maybe some folks relate to this, but maybe not. But I, I, uh, I grew up in a small, very working class town in, in central West Virginia. I didn't know, uh, nobody I knew had gone to college, and certainly no one had been to a gallery or museum. Uh, and so I was, as I, as I sort of, you know, started making work and, and I moved to New York City and, and started working in the museum and galleries there, had a studio on, on 27th Street in, in Chelsea, and I started, I, I never felt comfortable just making work out of whatever was in my head because I feel like, looking back on it, I feel like I didn't think that my subjecthood was worthwhile. Like, you know, I, I don't... Hopefully that doesn't sound depressing, but that's where, that's where it was. So like, why, why, why would anybody in, be interested in, in what I would make? And so I found that um, that discomfort would be put into some abeyance, I guess, if I worked on, if I found a subject that already existed, so it didn't seem like it was totally about me. So it was a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of an evasion somehow, or, or it, was, it was me managing psychological discomfort on some level. So when I found Supergirl, the movie, not the comic book, because uh, I say that because the first shows I had, it's like uh, Craig Drennan, work about Supergirl. A lot of comic book folks showed up and, and, <laughs> and had a lot of questions for me. And I was like, guys, I, and they, spoiler alert, they were all guys. I said, uh, you know, I, I really don't know anything about comics. This is from the 1984 movie starring Helen Slater. Uh, in the title role. And there was something about uh, the Supergirl movie, which was, again, a, a successful franchise, but an absolute failure, that there was something about it that was kind of beautiful. And I mean, Peter O'Toole is in it, for God's sake, you know, as uh, Zoltar. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's really crazy. And Helen, uh, Helen Slater, was about my age. I think there's a year's difference between our age. Uh, also, uh, gloriously, naturally blonde, both of us. <laughs> and, uh, and she got the part as a high school student. Like, and the Salkin brothers, who did the Superman movies, uh, said, oh, that was successful. Let's continue this money-making uh, project by having Supergirl. And they did over 300 auditions, actresses all over the world. And they ended up picking this unknown high school uh, kid. And so, you know, you can imagine if you're Helen Slater, you're in high school, now you're the star of this most popular franchise, you know, of, of the early 80s. And so I think looking back, a lot of uh, the Supergirl project was just like rationalizing like hope and obscurity and all of the things that we hope for as creative people and how it, it 
it, it, we don't know like how it's going to turn out. Like we don't know when the luck is going to come our way. And so Helen Slater, it was such a failure that she doesn't put it on her uh, CV now. Uh, she's trying to like distance herself from it, although she did make a guest appearance on the Supergirl um, a series that came much, much later after all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, to make, to make my task even more difficult, I watched the movie once uh, and I said, that's enough. <laughs> and then I, um, then I thought, you know what, I'm going to limit myself to the information I get on the VHS or the DVD case. The VHA. So uh, people came in saying, hey, where's pictures of like, you know, a, a cute young person in a tight fitting uniform? And I was like, oh no, I'm not doing that. I'm writing Helen Slater as Supergirl on notebook paper and then painting it. So, and there's Helen Slater as Supergirl front, near and far, as if the paper is close to you mm -hmm. and as if it's far away. I know you guys are smart. You have high SAT averages here at Virginia Tech, so I don't, I don't have to over explain things. And then I flip the same paper over and say, Helen Slater as Supergirl back near and far. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did, you know, this, this allowed me like a way of working and I did it for five and a half years and I tended to work in the, in the front and back and I sort of, of whatever I was doing. And, and so I, I like that because it was sort of foregrounded the idea of a simple investigation, just like a little mm -hmm. kid, like a toddler level, like, hey, what's on the back of that? Oh, nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was on the front? Maybe that's nothing too. And so, uh, so that, was, that was how it started. And it's me also just learning to paint. Mm -hmm. You know, I did have a painting degree, uh, and God bless all my previous instructors. They were very encouraging. But when I went to undergrad, um, I did go to a, to a school in, in Central West Virginia, a state school in West Virginia, and a lot of my uh, professors, uh, you know, they were, it was, it, you know, they went to school in the 70s, and so it wasn't about, uh, it wasn't about technical instruction, it was about sort of encouraging creativity, and so I, did, I never received that kind of deep or, and panoramic technical instruction, so I, there was a lot I didn't know about painting. So part of it is me also just learning how to paint and, find, and using this, this Supergirl project uh, and, and I like that me and Helen Slater were about the same age, and so I could treat her as my surrogate self-portrait, you know, as the, and even super girl, like super powerful. But girl is like slightly diminished, you know, somewhat. Like they're not like super woman or just, you know, super person. It's like, so there's something in the language I was also exploring in, in the early stages here about like uh, what you would call uh, what, um, you know, some of the theory people would call a weak sign, you know, where it's like it has a sign of strength, but then it's, it's deflated, mm -hmm. you know, so super girl, you know, mm -hmm. Timon of Athens mm -hmm. has the follow up after that. But yes, this was, uh, to answer your question, this was, this was the first part, mm -hmm. and it was the first long multi-year project I did, and I felt, uh, I felt very much at home. I did a lot of audio pieces where I would recite Helen Slater's lines, only her lines. <laughs> And I wish I had a recording of that, so you could all. Yeah. So you, I'll send I'll send uh, an MP3 to yeah. all of you, so you can play that in your car. Yeah. Uh, well, but I'll, play it. I'll I, play it during the next talk. Okay. Yeah, good. So it's like. Good. Yeah. But I uh, I I in reciting her lines, I, I realized that it's not super. Like her lines were all like, "Excuse me, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, pardon me." And I was like, wow, these, this is, I don't know who wrote this script, but this is not a powerful kind of, you know, super person. So, so even that, like, was a, was a very uh, interesting learning experience for me. So I did audio pieces, sculpture, uh, drawing and painting. I mean, and again, in every case, I'm just learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm, I got a teaching job, I'm teaching full time and, and just trying to kind of manage all aspects of life mm -hmm. and start a career in at what that time was coastal Georgia. You know, I, I had left New York. Uh, I got sort of chewed up and spit out, you know, by the New York art world. I was there seven and a half years, but then I landed in coastal Georgia, far away from everything. And I was like, all right, let's, let's, how can you start from here? Like, how can you begin a practice? And, and you know, with, with whatever ambitions you might have for your work, um, and then do that in a place where nobody's paying attention. You know, how do you, how do you do it? Well, I want to ask you about 
you mentioned it too, and this painting kind of shows it, the reversal right. like a aspect into and how you, you've talked about intervention into mm. the history of one with taking these lesser known works right. and projecting yourself in because it gave you space, right. but also uh, just the whole act of inversions, which like brings us back to like the Tim and then you approaching different themes throughout art history and, and one that's been repeated a lot is like how photography like killed mm. painting and your first instances in the uh, earliest works in the time of Athens was the Polaroid back. Mm, right. And <clears throat> What, what oh. um, sparked this decision? I know. Oh, there I it is. I surprised you. It snuck yes. up on you. Um, Just know it's there. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I will say that, um, you know, in, in starting, you know, I, I did the Supergirl project, and I learned a, a, a tremendous amount. And then I decided to, to shut it down. Uh, there are things that I wish I had uh, maybe done differently, but I was... But I didn't learn it until like year three or year four of, of you know, of the Supergirl project. I mean, for, for one, I limited my palette to only the colors in her costume. And so it was like red, yellow, and blue, which it turns out are also the primary colors. So that wasn't really a radical, you know. <laughs> there was nothing surprising about that to the audience. So, uh, so, so anyway, so I shut down the Supergirl project. And I thought with Time of Athens, I liked that it, was, um, that it wasn't... Uh, I mean, Supergirl was, was kitsch adjacent, which I was fine with. But I like that uh, with Shakespeare, suddenly it seemed classy and canonical. And it seemed like a different, uh, you know, sort of a, a different monument to kind of, you know, lean toward, a, a bigger windmill, you know, <laughs> to, to point toward. And so I like that. And then I, um, you know, I, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think like a painter. But I also um, ask a lot of questions about painting. And one of the questions is, like, why didn't photography kill it? Like, it seems like maybe it should have. One thing I like about painting, it's so simple. And, and I, many times when I'm working in the studio, whatever thoughts I'm, I'm trying to have, it will come crashing down to the physical fact that I'm holding a stick with hair on the end of it. You know, I was like, this is a brush, and this is the simplest possible tool. Like, what am I, what am I doing? Like, the absurdity of it, like, sinks in and comes, comes crashing back. And then, then, then after that, joy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, this is absurd. But, uh, you know, so I think about all of that, and I think about the, the conditions of painting. And what I like about painting is its simplicity and I don't, I don't say this lightly at the tail end of a pandemic, but I think that uh, painting behaves sort of like a virus because every new thing that comes out that's supposed to kill it only makes it stronger. And so photography was invented and folks thought, oh, that's the end, that's mm -hmm. it. 1839, it's over. There's no more painting after uh, Daguerre. But uh, turns out painting absorbed that because painting is not complicated. It's very simple, just like a virus is simple. It needs a host. So, uh, so to me, like s learning more about painting and studying the, uh, the ontological questions that painting asks, like what does it take to, for something to be a painting? What does it take to, for it to be a good painting? Like these questions are all kind of obsessive for me. And so I thought, well, what if I, you know, what if I have Polaroids? Uh, here, because I like that I like Polaroids as an invention because just as an invention, it really was one of the most radical, innovative, egalitarian inventions in the history of picture making since linear perspective. And then you turn the Polaroid over and you have the black monochrome, the abstraction of Malievich and the early early modernism. You have like the modernist end game on the back of a Polaroid, and you have the wide open lens based. Uh, revolution that's coming on the front of the Polaroid. So the Polaroid itself is like, it's, they're, I think they're amazing. Like, I love them. Uh, and I buy just boxes of Polaroids on eBay. Like, they're not expensive. Like, it's like, you know, one box of random Polaroids for $5 or whatever, which is what I did for the pieces you see out in, in the show. But 
And this is the part that's, uh, that's funny. I mean, I could have just glued a Polaroid to the front of the painting, like a lot of folks would do that. I have no problem with collage, and I'm not ideologically opposed to it, but being not successful for a long period of your adulthood, even into your middle years, being not successful for a long time will lead you to have no faith in the current age. <laughs> and so I thought, well, if I glue a Polaroid on, I mean, even the best adhesive might last maybe 15, 20, 20 years. Then I'll have to have conservation. And I thought, all right, I don't want to depend on people conserving the adhesive every 15 or 20 years. So if I just paint it, if I learn how to paint a Polaroid so it looks like a Polaroid, has the effect of the Polaroid at the scale, the exact size of a Polaroid, then it will last longer and the piece will last longer into a future generation that will finally love me. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. You're saying, wait a minute, Drennan, are you saying your work is about a desperate need for love? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yeah. I think that's every artist. <laughs> well, that's what he said. But that's why, that's why, uh, so I thought, okay, I have to learn how to depict things with absolute accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so that was where it came from. I wasn't super interested in that kind of trompe l'oeil virtuosity per se, but I realized that it was going to be useful. And, and part of, part of this, these long-term projects, it allows me to be greedy. So I, because I like, all styles of painting, basically. And so I, it allows me to cast a big net and, and pull it all in and to work in abstraction and in decorative uh, pattern painting and monochrome and representation of different types and so forth. And I get to have it all. You know? So uh, again, like that, doesn't, that doesn't come from like a noble urge. I think it's just greed. Like I want, I want all of it, you know? Uh, and so, so this, I developed the skill that I needed to have. You know, I developed the technique. I, I didn't enter any of these pieces knowing how to do the thing that I want to accomplish, so I have to learn every single time how to do it, which means I'm always uncomfortable. And I'm always feeling like I'm not, I don't know if I can do this or not. And then, then, I, then, I, then I ease my way to the finish line, and it's like, okay, that, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> well, the other thing that I like about this is what you were saying earlier of how like painting absorbs all the things that tried to kill it. Sure. And this was way of you interjecting yourself into like photography yep. and uh, conceptual art or as you mentioned before, like performance art with totally. you reading, totally. reading the Helen Slater lines. So this show is, is kind of different. And I mean, first I want to start, you know, with like how you, work yourself through all the characters but and then the follow up would be this being 14 years yep. like the previous shows that I've seen have really like focused on one character which right. depending on the time or ideas around that character differs so right. could you start by like telling more about how you progress through a character yep. how do you know it's done how you would jump to the next one I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good question, and, uh, and my answer is never satisfying to people because, uh, again, I, when I went to, I was in grad school in the early 90s, and in the, in the seminar rooms of the MFA programs of the world, the top art, the top of the hierarchy was conceptual art, conceptual-based practice. Like, that, that was the international style, the only thing that was going to lead to the promised land. But I never really believed that. And so uh, some people, people sometimes give me gr far more credit uh, for being a conceptual artist than I deserve because I don't actually believe in any of that. I believe in intuition. And so I, with every character, even like figuring out which one am I going to start with, I just intuitively picked, I mean, the first character was the mistresses, then flattering lords. And then I started going through the characters list and for each character, the number of pieces I make is also intuitive. Mm -hmm. And this is the point where, uh, you know, sometimes when I give an artist talk somewhere, this is where they start like pelting me with their, uh, with their rhetoric. But I believe in intuition because I think that uh, intuition is the number one survival tool for children and marginalized people. So if you have no cultural power, everyone around you is stronger, more economically powerful, physically powerful than you, 
the only way you're going to survive is intuition. And I always use, I mean, the example, that kid that gets off a bus after school and nobody's there to pick them up, they have to find their own way home and like make their own dinner and all that. Those kids are surviving due to intuition. And that's why, that's why I trust it, because I think our intuition wants us to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that my intuition wants me to survive. And so I, I am fine letting that lead the way. And so that determines which character's next, how many pieces, what the um, signifiers are, like what image, or even if it's, a, if it's abstraction, like what, what method I'm gonna use for each character is arrived at intuitively. I do practice it. I mean, intuition mm -hmm. doesn't, it's not magic. Like you have to work every day and be dedicated to your practice. And I draw every day. I have a sketchbook that I, that I work in uh, every day. You know, and I brought it with me on this trip and I feel weird when it's not around me, but I know where it is. Mm -hmm. So I always have to know where my sketchbook is or I, I, you know, I sort of, you know, I sort of lose it. So please don't steal my sketchbook. <laughs> if you want to say, hey, how can I undermine Drennan and make him go insane quickly? Uh, steal his sketchbook and he, he will lose his mind. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that is, that's how I, I mean, I made the decision because I, I didn't know that at first. Like it wasn't a, a truth held self-evident. That's from someone else from Virginia. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, 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 I would, that I'd go through the list of characters, but to me that seemed like a method because I liked looking down the list of characters' names in the play, and I said, all right, what I'm gonna do is I'll make something different for each character with, with thinking ahead that then if I have a show, any of the characters can be on stage with each other again. You know, and I, re I like that. And sometimes there, there's a collision because, you know, and I, I am each one of them, like I'm, I understand that. Sometimes my shows look like a group show sometimes, and, and, and that's been very off-putting uh, to the commercial gallery world sometimes. They're like, Drennan, what are you doing? You're killing us. Just do one thing so we can like, what do they call it? Form a brand? <laughs> but I, uh, you know, that's not, you know, I, that's, that's not why I'm in the game. So, so I, but I like this idea um, and I don't want to leapfrog ahead because maybe mm -hmm. this is a, a, a question coming, but by chance in 2004, I met an acting coach in Los Angeles. I had my first time I showed in Los Angeles, of course I met an acting coach at the opening. <laughs> and she was great and she was actually in a movie with Helen Slater, <laughs> you know? So a lot, and she came up to me, and it was, you know, I, I showed some Supergirl pieces, and she came up to me, this acting coach, and she was like kind of astonished, and she's like, you know Helen? And I was like, no. <laughs> Do you? And she's like, yeah. We were in um, Legend of Billie Jean together, which is a, actually a great movie. You should watch it tonight. Um, <laughs> and so she was, she was like, her experience was like, this is so unbelievably weird. Why is this guy like doing all this work about Helen Slater? But he's not like obsessed with her face, so maybe I'm not a, a stalker, <laughs> which I'm not. Uh, and so I gave, uh, I gave like an exhibition catalog of the Supergirl work to this person. I was like, well, if you see Helen Slater, like show her, what, show her this. And I did get a note back from Helen Slater's people, which was uh, um, good luck with everything. We don't want to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> Like, God bless, good luck, uh, which is fine. Like, that's totally fine. Um, but I say this because I, uh, I mean, even I mean, Supergirl is, is a movie. Like, there was something about performance and acting that was in my head for reasons I don't even know why. Time of Athens, of course, is a play. And so I started to, you know, the skill acquisition and the delivery method for each character I really learned a lot. This acting coach took me under her wing. She had no reason to do that, but she taught me. I, I went to her place in LA and she's like, all right, have you heard of Stanislavski? <laughs> Here's how we begin. And so I learned like intro to method acting from this person and she makes a lot of money in uh, Hollywood. Whenever you see a singer, rapper in a movie, she trained them. She's, her specialty is taking the talented non-actor and turning them into a, a, a competent actor. <laughs> I chose my word carefully, competent. <laughs> um, but I, I say that, and this isn't the diversion it seems to be, 
But I say that because I learned, and she said to me, she's like, when you're painting, every time you hold the brush, you're accessing an, a place on an emotional spectrum, you're accessing muscle memory, all the things the actors in the room already know. But this was news to me, and I was like, oh, you're right. She's like, here's how you get out of that. Here's how you increase the emotional range that you can hit. And all, again, that is like, I'm sure the acting students here do that remarkably well, but for me, this was like, the sun rising in the east. I was like, what? And so I began using, with, with the Timing of Athens pieces, I, I use painting as a form of acting. And so when you see multiple different techniques used in a room, I'm treating it just like I have a, like a one person show, which I'm not gonna do tonight. <laughs> uh, but I, I, it's as if I have a one person show with like, Four different characters, four different backstories, four different accents, each one done perfectly. That's how I see my painting exhibitions. You know, so it's not that I'm hiding or that I'm, I'm evading uh, scrutiny. It's as if I, I want to be kind of seamlessly inhabiting every, and just disappearing into each character. Some of the characters are funny. Some of the characters are a little mean. Some are pensive, some are sad, some are, overly complicated, you know? Each one has its own different spot that I like to hit, or try to hit, on the emotional, you know, uh, spectrum. So, so that's how, that's my uh, very long answer to your mm -hmm. question, but that's how the characters get built. Mm -hmm. And this show is the second in the series of the first acts, being scene two is, right. the, is the clue. And, well, yes. And these are combining multiple characters, yeah. so uh, you, you're approaching it, as you said, like a revival? Well, it's interesting you say that, yes. Uh, late last year, I was approached by a place in Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta Contemporary, which is a non-collecting museum, and they, um, they were approaching their 50-year anniversary, and I had, been a, um, I had been a resident artist. They have a residency program, Atlanta Contemporary, for a studio residency, and I had been in their residency program for three years back early on. And uh, they said, you know, we're approaching our 50th anniversary. We want, we'd like to have, you know, we'd like to showcase some of our previous uh, studio artists, and, you know, you want a, a prize or two that, that you know, we'd like to include that under the canopy of Atlanta Contemporary as well. So maybe let's start thinking about a show. And they have a policy where they um, hire a different curator for every show. So which is also kind of interesting that they're, the, the authorial voice of the institution is constantly shifting because the curators are constantly shifting. So I found a curator who was willing to take on this project and Atlanta Contemporary and the curator both said, you know, let's, let's look at the first pieces you did when you started Time of Athens. Let's go back to the beginning and, uh, you know, and, and see what was there and see how predictive the works were. But let's, mm -hmm. just, let's just look at it because nobody that really hadn't been shown. And so that was, that was why the first act, so it was like the first things Drennan did out of the gate. And then... Um, then how are we gonna combine these characters? And so with Atlanta Contemporary, we had one combination that the, the curator, who was Bridget Mulholland, who I can't say enough good things about, like she, she took on the project, she did all of her curatorial duties, and she did it like her father passed away in the middle of it, and she still like showed up and, I mean, I told her, I was like, you know, you don't have to do this, like this is too much, but she was like, no, I, you know, I, I fulfill my obligations, and I, it, you know, it's good for me to do it, so. So we did all of that, and, um, and it was the first time that the multiple characters, like this many characters, were put together because, mm -hmm. and I, I think it's just time. Like when I first started, like the first year in, every time I tried to show my work to people, I got the, what, what's the acronym, WTF? <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? You're doing like, what? Like Shakespeare? But this is, I don't see any Shakespeare in this. And I was like, no, you're right. But here's this, I'm doing something else. And so it was early on, it was really hard to kind of lead, to like just communicate to people what was happening. Now after 14 years, it has accumulated and now I think it kind of makes, I mean, sense sort of, or, or, or the learning curve is a little easier. Not that, not that there is one, because I, I rely on 
people just getting that that physical experience of the work is plenty for me. Like you don't have to know the backstory; it's totally fine. But uh, I think we're now, or I'm now at a place where curators are now looking at it and saying, hmm, which is what, mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, I, I have to say, I, I knew Brian back in uh, Atlanta and had a show at the gallery he used mm -hmm. to, 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 that he founded and used to manage called Saltworks. And Brian was always uh, really good at laying out the shows. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, for this show as well, Brian had some ideas about, you know, well, let's, let's change a few things, let's do this, you know, so slightly differently. And it all, I think it all worked out, mm -hmm. you know, elegantly and I think uh, you know shows the work to the best advantage but now I think now I'm in kind of a new phase where people are saying it's it's like uh, I have I have characters that people can play with now like mm -hmm. curators especially uh, it's malleable like people are starting to see like aha like there's there's things mm -hmm. that can happen here that Drennan hasn't thought of which is true like there's always it's why uh, whenever I have a show somewhere I, am, I immediately defer to whoever the curator or the director of the place is because they always have ideas that I didn't think of that turn out being way better than what I would have thought of. Mm -hmm. And sometimes other artists are like, Drennan, like, don't you wanna like fight for your rights? And I was like, you know, when you're around very smart people, uh, let them do their job, <laughs> you know? And it always <laughs> makes me look better. So, uh, so yes, so, so I'm always, every curator, every uh, director of, of, a, of a gallery space or a museum, I, I'm very interested in hearing what they have to say because it, they always find a new angle that, that is interesting. Yeah, and before Craig gives me too much credit, I am also one of those curators that said WTF when he first showed me the Supergirl <laughs> series, and it was probably, what, five years after that? Oh, you know, things marinate. Maybe something, they marinate maybe something like as that. Long, for the appropriate and time. It wasn't, and it wasn't because of <laughs> Craig stalking me and calling me up, you know, like Helen. And, uh, <laughs> but it was just, I saw the work evolve, and sometimes it takes the curator time. Oh, totally. I mean, it's, it's especially, especially when it's something new. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. And I understand all of that, and I, uh, you know, Again, like I, I understand. Like that, at that first blush, people are like, "What?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe even here, maybe people, and you know, people are super polite. So nobody said that last night exactly, <laughs> but um, but but it's but I understand it. Like it's it's not strange. And I, um, when I'm making the work, again, I have all of this mechanism in my brain. I spend a lot of time in my own head, like thinking of these characters and what they might be and what the next one's going to be. But nobody needs to know that. Like whenever, I mean, I, I really believe in people just experiencing the work with no, uh, you know, prior knowledge. If the work can't survive in, in that, then it's not going to survive. Like it, it's not. And I really think that uh, there's an old line that the, the painter and critic Fairfield Porter used to say, where like a work of art is, is sort of like a person. We respond to them like people. If it's sexy and interesting, then we want to learn more. If it's not, if it's boring or mean or aloof or impossible, then we don't. And you will, you will learn more about the work that is, is seductive to you. And I, I'm fine with that because that's how I do it too. Like when you walk into the Louvre, hopefully, I mean, I, I did it much later in life than most artists my age. But if you walk into the Louvre, you look left, there's a big history painting that says the surrender of Cornwallis. You're like, oh, I know, I know exactly what that is. You guys probably do. Okay, whatever. Bad example, <laughs> but I didn't. You know, and I look to the right. It's like, uh, you know, the coronation of Sesostris. And I'm like, oh, what? So I, we normally look at art in a state of very limited knowledge where we're relying on our eyes. And we're, we're you know, again, if it's seductive, we will follow and learn more. If it's not, we won't. And I, I support that. I support that way of, of making art and looking at art. So I'm never, ever one to say like, oh, don't look at my show. Read, the, read Time of Athens first. Like, in fact, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> I, would, I would not torture people like that because I think just look at it. And if anything's there, then you, know, then you can always learn more. You can always come back to it. 
But I'm a big believer in just letting the, the piece do its work if it's going to survive. The great uh, filmmaker, Jack Smith, like uh, hopefully you look at some of his videos, he never had commercial success, was always an underground kind of artist, artist kind of person, but he would say that uh, just like the stock market, like the art world, like eventually will correct itself and, and every, like the good will eventually force its way into, you know, into it, whatever, whatever it's going to be. It's going to find its audience because just like iron filings being attracted to a magnet. The iron filings can't help it. They're pulled toward the magnet. And I think every work of art is a magnet like that. It will find, it will find what's attracted to it and pull it towards it, given time. And so time is, yeah, time mm -hmm. is, you know, as, as I enter my middle years, I'm starting to think, well, maybe time is my enemy, but, but I know that it's not, you know, and so, um, you know, even though I made an enormous tea filled with clocks ticking down in the, <laughs> in the lobby or down yeah. in the gallery as, as we speak. But, uh, but, I, but I'm, yeah, I sort of trust the work and I trust people and I, I think that the audience is going to come at the speed that, that's natural to them. So, mm -hmm. so these stories, I mean, it's totally fine, like whatever time it takes. I, I've always had a small but very loyal following, which I, I'm very appreciative of. I'm, I've, it's remarkable that I've had that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then if the, and then if it gets a little bigger, that's fine too, mm -hmm. you know? So you mentioned time. I mean, besides like the labor that it takes and everything, but also of how there's always these life events that get absorbed by the paintings themselves, and how do you um, use like autobiographical mm -hmm. elements into the in your paintings? How much are they like? Because I've heard you mention that this is a going towards like an investigation towards self-portraiture. Well, it was th that's a good qu a good question, and that's uh, only recently come out. The first characters, I will say, like uh, mistresses, the maskers who are. Uh, don't even have speaking roles in the play, or like old Athenian, like so, and so forth. Some of the early characters were, I, I was thinking, you know, what, we always have these thoughts, what we think is happening in our, in our life, but I was thinking, oh, this is, I'm going to be, this is about criticality, this is about me sort of undermining the Western canon, ha ha. You know, uh, and then I realized, I mean, maybe there was a drop of that, but the more I worked, the more I realized it was actually more about me and my um, anxieties and my, um, you know, what, what, what faults or what I, what, what I was trying to correct or what, or what I was kind of trying to use the work to massage within my own sort of, you know, mind and personality. And in that, the farther along the characters came, and, and I, it was pointed out to me. It's like, then they start to suddenly, they... They don't have that same kind of critical sharpness, maybe, but they, there's something else that, that, come, that was coming in, and, I, and it turned out that it was more and more autobiographical elements were sneaking in, and I didn't realize it, into where like the, the, the character I'm working on now, the merchants, are all circular. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, there's some. They're all circular, and there's a character in the play called Merchant, a very minor character, but I, I remember as a little kid in the 70s, bless you. Who was that? Was that Eric Stanley? Wow. He's allergic to virtuosity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I, I was thinking of, okay, character of merchant. And I was like, all right, what would, and again, I'm, I'm drawn in the sketchbook. I'm going through page after page of just merchant. What would it be? Like, what would be interesting? I'm waiting for like something to emerge. And I remember being a, a little kid in the 70s, and every uh, Saturday, we, uh, my, go with my mom to the laundromat, you know, because it's a small town, and again, in working class town, not everybody had washer and dryer, especially back then. And so we go to the laundromat, and I'm sure that it was not an, an enjoyable experience for her, but I loved it, because I'm there, I get to hang out with mom, like it's all sloshy and warm and cool, I mean warm, by temperature, cool, just because you're hanging out, you know, you're hanging out with the grown-ups. And she would give me four quarters, and I could play whatever I wanted. There was a jukebox in this laundromat, and you could play whatever I wanted. 
And I thought I waited all week for it. And then I would actually memorize because, again, I, for whatever reason, I had a very good memory. And so I, would, I found that I could memorize the, the songs on the jukebox, starting with Abba, ending with Warren Zevon. A <laughs> lot of stuff in between. <laughs> And so I would, as a little kid, I would put the quarter in, and I, I thought it was great how a quarter is a circle. You put it in, and then you see the record pop out, which is a different kind of circle. And I remember just being like, oh, there's the universe in action. <laughs> and then it would play my song, and I would like it. And I knew that there were songs that my mom liked, and so I, you know, I would, three of them would be for me, and then I would give her one. I'd give her Tanya Tucker, Delta Dawn, or whatever. <laughs> you know, she liked that one. But me, I would, you know, it was like Jackson 5, and it's ABBA, and it's like, you know, Sly and the Family Stone, or whatever. And so, uh, I use the circular shape for the painting to reference coins. And then the coins reminded me of records, which are also circular. So, these records, I painted them, which, again, I, uh, it, it's, I have like jeweler's glasses doing the song list with like a one hair brush. It's grueling and unpleasant, but I don't want them to seem that way. I don't want them to seem overworked. You'll notice the shadow under the, the pink record that's right there, which is uh, La Freak, by the way, <laughs> by Chic. Um, I, I put shadows on some of these because when I would show images to people, they would just say, oh, you know, we're not really interested in showing collage. And I was like, oh, it's not collage, you fool. <laughs> I, worked, I worked hard to paint that. And so I thought if I put a shadow under it, that'll tell me it can't be, it can't be glued down and pretending to float. Um, and so that was my plan. It didn't work. It, people still say, oh, you know, collage, who cares? Especially in a, Atlanta, where there's a lot of found object artists, a lot mm -hmm. of assemblage and collage art. That would even be like the number one style of work. And then I'm over here at my studio doing these like fake collage. But, but, you know, this, again, it's very autobiographical. It's about me and my mom and these songs that I remember and these records and the experience. There's money in it as well. If I floated some money around, there's a dollar bill floating in there. And it was brought to my attention, the editor of Art Papers magazine, uh, Sarah Higgins, I have to give her credit. She came to a studio visit. We're just, not really, you know, hanging out in the studio. And I was telling her the story and all of this, and she's like, oh yeah, I totally get that. Because these are like looking through the front, like a front-loading uh, washer, where it's like sudsy, and there's like a dollar bill that got loose that was in your pocket, and like all, and it, seemed, it was so obvious. Again, like other people are able to see like more than we are a lot of the times. But I also am a firm believer that like, and I say this to everybody, like the work can be smarter than you. Like the work can be leading you places. And that's why, again, the intuition, I trust it, because I feel like it's, it knows more than I do, and so I have to kind of follow it. And, and so this is where these are uh, landing. And the time and button, that is not invented. That's a real thing in the world that was discovered by Mr. Brian Holcomb. Yeah. He found some of these in a thrift shop or something. In Christiansburg. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently yeah. there was a political candidate named Timon who had these buttons made. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was like, oh, this part of the Shakespeare play. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, like Drennan's everywhere. <laughs> How did Shakespeare make buttons about these characters? That's right, that's right. But, uh, mm -hmm. and I was happy to put that in. Uh, because there's another character in the play called uh, um, Certain Senators. Like, they don't even have names. They're just like Certain Senators. And, and I have a separate character called Certain Senators mm -hmm. that are all the buttons around the McGovern campaign, mm -hmm. the 1972 <laughs> McGovern campaign. Yeah. McGovern, who, by the way, ran against Richard Nixon and had an mm -hmm. astonishing electoral loss. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I remember it because I was a first grader and that we had a, like a mock election. That's why there, there are McGovern buttons, or one mm -hmm. McGovern button up there. And I remember as a first grader, like, casting my vote, and I thought I had figured it out. I was like, oh, McGovern's gonna win, because he has Govern in his name. <laughs> and I was, so, I was so filled with delight, I could barely walk up to the front of the class and put my little slip of paper in the cardboard box. And I said, oh, I did it, no one, no one knows but me, I figured it out. And then uh, in our class, and in, in America, McGovern lost, <laughs> like, brutally, a brutal, like, at that time, the biggest electoral loss in history. 
until uh, until uh, someone named Michael Dukakis came along. But <laughs> anyway, so there is a separate character called Certain Senators where there's a lot of McGovern buttons that I also buy uh, on eBay. Uh, so. So if you see uh, Polaroids or, or McGovern campaign buttons on eBay, mm -hmm. don't buy them because chances are I'm already bidding on them. So uh, please mm -hmm. don't uh, interrupt my flow <laughs> yeah. uh, as I'm trying to make the work. Yeah. But again, these more recent characters, I, like I never would have, have allowed characters to blend together in the early days. They all had hard boundaries. Mistresses are here, flattering lords are here, the maskers are here. Now it suddenly doesn't, it seems fine for them to marble together somewhat. And mm -hmm. I can't explain why, what's different about it other than, I mean, I'm sure my doctors say, uh, well, Drennan, you're a more well-adjusted human being now. <laughs> Not as compartmentalized as they kept telling me. And, and so, so maybe, maybe it's that, but I, I'm happy with this sort of blending together. And, 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 you know, these were all made during pandemic. And so that dot pattern on the circle Originally, when I first said, you know, merchant, I thought, all right, I'm remembering the coins, but I am holed up in my house because of uh, COVID. And that those, those early illustrations of the COVID virus, remember what those looked like? It was like that little cartoon that didn't seem dangerous. It was a little too cartoony, actually. Like it had no sense of danger. It was just like a little like alien ball with dots on it uh, and spike proteins that were made comical. And so I used that. I used the COVID virus as my sort of compositional device. I got like some plastic uh, plexiglass balls and I just put stickers on it and then photographed it. And that's how I start. That's how I get the composition around the circles. That's why it seems like there's, they seem three dimensional, like there's a front and then a back of the sphere because there actually was. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's, there's, um, that's, the, yeah, that, I even forgot the question, but I'm sure I answered it beautifully. You were, because <laughs> right. you were talking about your life. And oh, how yeah, you, yeah, the you, autobiography. How you put your, how it's right. all about you. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and then I, I actually went to the Christiansburg store looking for McGovern buttons, which there are a lot of. So just to let you know, and then that's where I found the timing. But See. at this point, I would like to open it up to questions to the audience. If anybody has a question for Craig, he's... He's open. I mean, even not about his work. Yeah, I'll so. answer anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, question, front row. Yeah, so I was just curious, because I feel like sometimes as an artist, your mindset towards success can make or break you. Yeah. So I was just curious, like, how would you as an artist measure success? Oh, boy, that's a great question. See, I knew you guys were smart. <laughs> All right. I will say that, I mean, when I think of my artistic heroes, or just any of my heroes, it was always people who could make something out of nothing. Like those are whether, I mean, I, I grew up playing basketball and being a high jumper, so I love like track and basketball. And so all those, my favorite sports stars were the people where like they, again, they started with nothing. Like no, the odds were against them, nobody was helping them. It seems like they just, came up out of the ground, you know? And I, um, and artistically, those are the artists I always really like. And so for me, that's connected to my idea of success. And so for me, success was being able to continue doing the work. Like that really was it. I've had students, I mean, I've taught a lot of, I mean, I worked in museums and galleries. I've had so many kind of jobs. I've been, I've been a, a, a custodian, I've been an elevator operator, I've been a drywall uh, installer. You know, I have so many different types of jobs because I had to in my life. Like I could never not be working. And so, uh, you know, that is part of it as well. Like the idea of like, okay, I just need a day job to pay the bills so I can continue just making the work. And that, that was like the biggest part of it, just being able to continue, you know. And I, I have students who've had tremendous success and have become... I don't want to out any of them, but they become even I would say like affluent. They become like really successful. Sometimes when uh, you know in the past, uh, one of my first students to get some success with this uh, fellow uh, who I adore, Michael Scoggins, like really great guy, and I and I knew sort of that he that he seemed like he was doing well. He's he was living off his work, and it's like everything is great. And then I went to his apartment in New York, and I was like, oh, 
He's doing very well. <laughs> but great. I mean, I, and other people too. Summer Wheat, one of my students. We've got Eric Stanley right here, believe it or not, with one of my old students. But he's doing well in spite of that. <laughs> yeah, I tried my best to hold him back, but it didn't work. But I, but I think that's an interesting point because especially, you know, in, in this kind of Instagram saturated moment where there's a lot of talk about being on brand and, and the hustle and, and just, you know, the endless kind of like uh, market awareness, I guess. You know, I, I haven't sold a, a huge amount. Like, in, and I'm, I'm 56 years old. And like in the last 18 months, I've done okay in terms of sales. Like all that prior time, not okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I couldn't put I couldn't put success based on like you know on that on, on that as the indicator. So for me, it was just about making the work, and uh, just finding, you know, somebody who would be willing to show it. You know, and I and I always tell, you know, I tell people, young artists, when they ask, you know, you don't. You don't need like a hundred people to love you. You just you just need like maybe maybe two, you know, like one curator and one gallery director. And if you got a critic, if that's a third one, you're you're fine. <laughs> and and friends and partners, spouses, yeah, yeah all that. Yeah. <laughs> Which, yeah, it's one of the reasons why I paired Steve Locke mm -hmm. and Craig Drennan together because they've been friends since 2006. They yep. actually met up at Skowhegan. Yep. and. Both of them been very supportive of each other, even during these like different times. Yep. Um, and I don't take offense, but I did sell your show very well. The, oh yeah, sorry, that's right. Show. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But no, that, that was that was, that was, that was one, a high point. But that, that was, was one month <laughs> out of. <laughs> and as you know, you like to get a paycheck more than one month out of every ten years. That's true. So. No, it's it's actually it's very true. It's very yeah. true. It helps. It was it was amazing. That was a, that was the high water mark. The last That's right. a long time. That's right. And I'm very happy to be eclipsed now. No, so. no, it's it's all all good. Um, oh, how awkward. No. No. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> uh, but 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 that that actually it's good because as a young person you're always trying to like gauge like could you want to I mean if you have some ambitions you want to do well, and this is why. In conversation, I mean, I, I write some art criticism, art writing, I, I don't know, art writing, I would call it more than art criticism. And I wish I had time to do more because I really do like it. But one of the things I always like to talk about is talent. And it, that word has been banished a lot from the art world. You won't see it much in art magazines. You'll hardly hear it in academia, to be honest, because it feels like kind of a you know, don't, don't say that. Don't, don't, don't say anything about talent. But I love talking about talent. Because, and the reason is because talent is random. Like talent pops up. It can pop up anywhere. It can pop up in a poor person. It can pop up in any kind of marginalized person. Suddenly like, it can pop up in a refugee. It's like the most talented person in their whole town. And on, on the other side, people with tremendous affluence and ease in their life, it may not, talent may not appear. And that's why I love it, because it is random, and that's why I think it's dangerous, and that's why it's been banished, is because, well, we can't predict talent. Let's, let's go somewhere else, because, you know, that's, it's, it's a little wild. And I think as an artist, and I'm, I'm going to go back to your success question, because I think that was actually a very important, excellent question. Everybody's going to have some kind of talent in there, and I think of talent, I really think of it as a wild animal that I'm trying to domesticate, because I wanted to do stuff. You know, those first people that saw a horse and they thought, oh, look at that crazy thing. Like, that looks strong. Like, maybe that could be helpful to us, raising our crops. And so I think of talent that way. Like, and some folks, they never learn how to, you know, tame their talent. It, like, comes and goes. It's unpredictable. It does what it wants and ignores them. And the people who I think enter into some kind of success are the people that say, okay, talent, you and me got to get along. I'm going to give you plenty of room to breathe, and I'm going to feed you, and you're going to do things for me, and you're going to do it, oh, not, not when you feel like it. You're going to do it every day when I need you. And I really do think of talent as like kind of separate from, my, from, from me, but I'm, but I'm constantly trying to get it to do more for me. Because I, I, you know, on paper, here's a, here's a kid born, very young parents, 
super, super working class. I mean, mo by most people in America's standard, it would be struggling even. Like, neither of my grandparents had running water. Like, in 1986, you know, when Michael Jackson's Thriller was the number one album in America, neither of my grandparents had running water. America had, had done two successful space shuttle flights in America. And this, again, I'm in, I, I have the power of the United States and the weakness of my hometown, like simultaneously. Strong, weak. Again, time of Athens. Strength, you know, and, and the opposite of strength. And so all of that comes together, and I, on paper, there was no reason why I should have been talented. And I say that because, uh, this is being recorded, I hope. Um, uh, in the first grade, I was in the era, one of the first times when there was widespread standardized testing, and I did really well on standardized tests. I did so well that the school became kind of suspicious. It's like, this can't be our number one student. He cannot have gotten a 99.9. Because, and it was all just because of like class. They were like, it can't be like the factory workers, kid. But it was. And so there's like, oh, can you do it again? And the next one's like, oh yeah, he did. Uh, and, and so on. And so that's why I think like, it's, it's important to recognize that because I was someone who wasn't supposed to have talent on paper. It wasn't supposed to be there, but it was. And I try to develop it, and that's been the thing that's, I mean, I train that, to use the analogy again, I, I, I train that horse like a little better every year, and it, it does a little more for me and pulls me a little further. So I think for me, like that's been, that's been that the only pathway to success has been trying to, you know, figure out how to develop my talent, how to build it, how to let it breathe, how to let it grow, and how to let it do more for me. And I encourage all of you folks to do the same because, again, that's the part, that's, that's the wildness, you know, talent, because it is unpredictable. Fran Lebowitz, one of the writer, uh, even says that. I don't know why I said even. Why wouldn't she say it? She's very bright. She's written like 40 books. Okay, we'll, we'll take that out in post. Let's go to a clip. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for Craig? They're like, no, let us out of here. Oh, I, 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 is there one in the back? Okay. <laughs> I have a question for Cameron. Great. Mm. Well, um, all right. I feel like this is one of those moments, if I were uh, in Australia, this is a moment where I threw a boomerang and then forgot about it, and it came around years later and hit me. Because <laughs> I feel like we talked about this in class way back in the day. Uh, you know, uh, in, in semiotics, and I, again, I don't, I don't lean hard into this, but you guys already know that, um, you know, I could... I could draw a picture reasonably well of, of, uh, of a tombstone, let's say. I'll, I'll use that example. And I would say, hey, look, everybody, I went to a graveyard. And they're like, did he? Or I could write the word tombstone. And I was like, look, I wrote this word. That I, I, I was really at a graveyard. And they're like, was he? <laughs> or I could take a piece of paper and do a rubbing from an actual grave and then show it to you and say, I went to a graveyard. You're like, oh yeah, he did. There it is. And so those three different examples I showed you were, uh, you know, different, different type, different references, different signs, different types of signs. An icon being a representation of a tombstone, a symbol being like the language, the, the letters that spell out the word tombstone in English, and then an index being a physical trace. So the physical trace always feels like it's closer to authenticity and authority, which is what photography used to have. And that's why photography has that feeling of the real, because it used to be indexical. It's not anymore. And this is, this is my whole point of why painting is powerful as, as a creative method, because photography, think of Photoshop and think what's happened in film. You know, all the Marvel movies started as drawings. 
Because, yeah, you want somebody to fly, you want them to, like, web to shoot out of their wrist inexplicably, sure, you can make that happen. If you're going to film it, it was impossible up until very recently because they're like, oh, there's no way to do that, until photography and film became, they got rid of their indexical part and said, you know, let's be like painting, where if you can imagine something, you can make it visible. Like, that's what painting could always do, drawing and painting. If you can imagine it, you can make it visible. And so I think that those boundaries between which is better, a, a, a picture of something, a language about something, or a physical trace of something, uh, I feel like those used to be hard categories, but those are all blurred now. And that's why I, may, I paint a fake shadow, I paint a symbol, like a, a representation of a shadow to try to get you to think that the record is real, that it's a real, and the drips that are a real physical trace um, are never real drips. Like I'm, I'm, I, in my studio, I splatter out on tracing paper and plastic all kind of different shapes and drips and I use them as my references. So the drips are actually, the things that look indexical are actually representational depictions of a drip, and the things that you think are, uh, anyway. But I, I, don't, uh, I don't get on my hind legs about that because I, now I think those boundaries are so porous that nobody can tell what's what. Which you guys know that. When you look at Instagram, like it's like, you know, you know that 1% of it is real. You know, that's, I mean, that's not shocking, but it's fine. You're telling a story, like storytellers have always done. You're uh, dissatisfied with my yeah. answer, Eric Stanley. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will have to add that Craig wrote a grant to go to London to the Shakespeare Globe and <laughs> yes. do rubbings and stuff. So I remember that yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And then he painted those rubbings. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. This is a true story. The first national Some... grant I ever won was uh, Art Matters grant. And I said in my, in my proposal, I want to go to the Globe Theater, because uh, I'd never been there, and I want to do rubbings of the exterior of the Globe Theater. And in, in the process, and they said, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, what does Zizek say? A weak yes. They're like, <laughs> okay, question mark. <laughs> but they did give me the amount I asked for. So I flew to the Globe Theater. I asked permissions to take a rubbing. I had done my research and I knew the original Globe Theater burned to the ground. The, the replacement burned to the ground. And the one that I was actually doing the rubbing of was made in 1996. Yeah. <laughs> so it was no more authentic than a TGI Fridays. <laughs> You know, but that was fine because it was a rubbing from the Globe Theater. So I, I typed my tracing paper and all the unemployed actors who were working there would come out and smoke their cigarettes. It's like, it's like, what are you doing? That's perfect British accent, by the way. Um, and then I would say, oh, I'm doing this. It's for art. And they're like, all right, okay. They were like curious, but not enough to like spend more than one minute. But so I did my rubbings over, it rained a lot. So it took like four days to like get enough. I folded them all back up, brought them to the U.S., had them scanned, <laughs> had them projected them, and then immediately started carefully painting all of the, all of the rubbings that I had taken. So, so that, yeah, that shows you how, how little I, uh, I honor the boundary between all the different <laughs> types of signification. Well, Be glad they rebuilt yeah. the Globe Theater. It now has excellent plumbing, and it now has HVAC, it has a, a quiet AC system. So be thankful that you're not there, you know, urinating right on the ground like, uh, like some of the old timers had to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do that, but you don't have yeah. to now. It's a choice. Yeah. I, think, I think that's a wonderful period for this. <laughs> and scene. And scene. And scene. Thank you all for coming today. Thanks, and everybody, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you have more questions, Craig Drennan on Instagram, like usually people will DM me some later fans, like that thing you said, that sounded stupid. Like, will you explain it? And I'll say, <laughs> I will. I always will. All right, but thanks everybody, Thank truly. You. Thank you. Great, huh?